Hey guys, welcome back to another video, except today is not my typical video. So this is going to be the first reference video I'm attempting to film. And what that is, is essentially kind of like the not frequently asked questions, but kind of. It's questions that I get that are like the basic, what's your soil mix? What's your pond mix? What fertilizers are you using right now? What size is your greenhouse? Just sort of the basics of um, my plant care regimen and what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to throw up the table of contents. Um, so I'm gonna show you kind of the things that I'm covering today with the timestamps if you're looking for something specific. And hopefully um, I can just pin this to my YouTube page or my YouTube channel and people can find these quick answers without having to go through hours and hours of videos. So yeah, that is what today is and hopefully you guys find it helpful. I plan to do one of these every year in the beginning of the year if possible, just in case things change. If they don't change, then I'll just keep the previous years up. I hope that makes sense. The first thing I wanna talk about are my substrates. So. The Aeroid mix that I'm using, this is a general mix. I am using this for my philodendron, I'm using it for my Ripsalis, I'm using it for my cacti, my Hoya, pretty much anything that's not an Ethereum. The only exception is for my succulents and cacti, I'll add a little bit of pumice or I'll even add a little bit of sand just to make it a bit more gritty, but that's the only difference. So in this Aeroid mix, I have, right now, I'm using the Promix Mycorrhizae soil, or I'm also using the Fox Farms Happy Frog mix. I've also used the, I think it's like the sea soil mix before, but that one was a little bit too dense for me. Just keep in mind that both of these soils, the Promix and the Happy Frog, they're both peat based and I know, you know, we're not wanting to contribute to that industry a lot because it is harmful for the environment. So I do try and only buy one bag of soil per year. It does help that I am using pond a lot and I'm reusing my pond over and over again. So I have really been able to keep to one bag a year, but yeah, just keep that in mind. So in this mix, I mix it with fur bark, coarse perlite, worm castings, biochar, and sometimes slow release fertilizer. The fur bark that I'm using is actually reptile fur bark that you use for reptile enclosures, and I just get this at PetSmart. They sell a pretty big bag for like $24, and it's way cheaper than some of the fur bark that you'll get at your garden centers. Another option you can use that's a little bit more expensive but it's gonna last you a longer time is Orchiata. Orchiata is a great substitute for fur bark and in general, it's just not going to deteriorate the way that fur bark does. So that's also an option but I'm not using that in my soil right now solely for the cost. Hopefully I didn't miss any ingredients in my Aeroid mix and the only other mix really that's different is the one that I'm using for my Ethereum right now. So I am growing some Ethereum in pond, but right now a majority of them are in um, a soil mix. In the Ethereum mix, I'm using the same base, either the Pro Mix or the Happy Frog. I add tree fern fiber, I add coarse perlite, worm castings, fur bark, sometimes slow release fertilizer and biochar. The only other thing that I've been recently adding is cocoa peat, which is basically like shredded cocoa husk. I've heard that you need to wash this out to kind of remove some of the salts, but since I'm using drainage holes for most of my Ethereum right now, I don't really worry about that since when I'm watering them, I am sort of flushing them out naturally. So just keep that in mind. I just like using it because I find that it's like a good binder for the roots. It's just, I've noticed so much more vigorous root growth with adding the shredded cocoa husk. I used to also use cocoa chips, but I didn't like how the roots would grow into the chips. And if you ever repotted or 
tried to remove the roots from those chips, it would break the, the root entirely. So I much prefer the shredded version. But really the only main difference between my Anthurium mix and my Aeroid mix is the use of tree fern fiber. And I'm really only using tree fern for my Anthurium and also for my moss poles. I don't find that with the cost of tree fern fiber that it's really necessary for any other genus because they just do fine in regular soil and because i'm a little bit more on edge i guess with my theory i'm still kind of learning about them i just feel a bit more comfortable using tree fern fiber the next substrate that i'm using is lechuza pond so i'm using two different types right now i'm using the lechuza lechuza pond brand pond and i'm also using ina's mix from the variegated plant shop i will link both in the description i don't use either of them just straight. I actually always amend them with perlite. I've heard mixed things about adding perlite to ponds. Some people love it, some people hate it, but I personally haven't had good experience in the past using pond on its own. It's a very heavy substrate. I'm not saying that it's not able to be done because right now I have a plant, my really huge Thai constellation growing in pond, solely pond, no perlite, and the roots are happy, healthy, and fine. Even though it's very heavy, it's very compacted. But in the past, with my other plants, I just have not had good luck with the roots lasting a long time in pond when it's not amended with perlite. So I usually add about half and half of perlite, or I'll do like 80% pond, 20% perlite. And then the last substrate that I'm gonna talk about is my tree fern fiber mix. So right now, the only thing I'm really using this tree fern fiber mix for is for rehabbing anthurium and rehabbing kind of stubborn rooting plants, rehab plants. So this mix is essentially just tree fern fiber, worm castings, a little bit of leftover pond, and some coarse perlite. I don't really like using tree fern fiber on its own. I know a lot of people have success with it, but I find that short term, it's really great for getting roots started, but long term, it always ends up rotting on me. No matter if the environmental conditions have stayed the same, no matter if my watering has stayed the same, it just always ends up going bad so I always always amend my tree fern fiber and I also like that when you add things like perlite you're making it stretch a lot longer and you can make that cost of tree fern fiber go down by a lot when you're able to kind of extend it and essentially double the amount that you have when you're adding things like perlite and pond. In terms of where I buy all of the things that I used for my substrates. So I get my, I know that this isn't really gonna be helpful if you're not living in Canada, but, or Canada in the States, but I get both of my soils in stores. Um, it's a little bit too expensive to get the Happy Frog online. So there's a store that I get it at locally. If you are local to Vancouver, um, John's Plant Factory has it. I get my Mycorrhizae Pro Mix at Canadian Tire. That one is much cheaper than Happy Frog. And then in terms of perlite, I either usually order it from my friend Lauren or we do group orders from Home Depot. And I will see if I can get the link because my friend Jing is usually the one who orders it. And we order it together in bulk. And I'm gonna ask her for the link and that's where we get our perlite. I really like this perlite. There is still a good amount of dust, but it's not nearly as dusty as some of the coarse perlite that I've ordered in the past. And I think it's like the perfect grade and the perfect smoothness. So sometimes you'll see coarse perlite being sold and it's very, very rough and gritty and it's very porous. I mean, you want to a certain extent your perlite to be porous, but when it has that texture where there's just so many open pores, your roots will grow into it and it's like almost impossible to get it out. So the perlite that I've been using, the one from Home Depot, the Will Grow brand, if you're able to get Will Grow, it's very smooth. There's very little open, I guess, holes around the perlite so that it can't grow into it. Um, so that's where I get my perlite. I get my biochar from North Shore Tropicals, although I don't think she sells it anymore, but you can get that on Amazon. You can get worm castings at your local plant shop. 
You can get slow release fertilizer typically at your local plant shop or you can also get it on Amazon as well. And then again, the fur bark, I get it from the reptiles, not the reptile store, but I get it from PetSmart. Um, what's that other pet store in the States? Basically anywhere they sell plant, plant <laughs> animal supplies, you can probably find it there. And the brand that I'm using is this one, but I'm gonna link as much as I can in the description. So check that out if you guys um, don't check the description. Everything that I mentioned here will likely be linked. And then in terms of the cocoa peat, so the shredded cocoa husk, I also get this from Lauren. I'm not sure where she sources it, but I'm also sure that you can find this online. So the next thing we're gonna jump into is fertilizers, and I'm gonna have to have my phone on me for this one because there's a lot of numbers and a lot of things. So the fertilizer that I'm using right now is TPS1, and I really, really, really like this fertilizer. I feel like I can be very heavy-handed or I can go really light, and I won't see many i guess bad effects to my plants i have used other fertilizers in the past where when i wasn't very consistent or maybe i was a little too heavy one week um it definitely showed on some of my plants so i really like tps1 in terms of npk so if you guys don't know what npk they're basically the macronutrients that are essential for plant growth and that's um, it stands for nitrogen phosphorus and potassium and so when you see npks on bottles like 20 20 20 10 10 10 two five six whatever it is those are percentages of those macronutrients in the bottle and then the rest of it is usually i think they say it's like it's just other minerals and micronutrients. When I'm talking about my fertilizers in this section, just keep in mind that I'm using a 2.5 liter jug, which is essentially a reused orange juice bottle. For the TPS1, I am using about three to four milliliters every other week in that jug. For all my plants that are growing, they're getting three to four milliliter concentration in that 2.5 liter jug. The NPK for TPS1 is 3.2, 6.5, 4.1. I wanted to compare it to some of the fertilizers on the market that I think are pretty popular right now in terms of what people or what I've seen people use. So I'm gonna scooch over. I'm going to throw in the numbers of TPS on my belly. <laughs> And um, I'm gonna compare it first to Dynagro Foliage Pro. I've heard really, really good things about this fertilizer. I think my friend Alice is actually using it right now and maybe even Jing and maybe even Lauren. Maybe all my friends are using it except for me. I'm a creature of habit and I just like what works for me and I don't really like to change things up unless I go through all of my stuff first. So maybe I'll give that a shot later in the year, but for now I'm really liking TPS. Um, so anyway, Dynagro Foliage Pro, the NPK for this is 936. Another really popular fertilizer right now that has been hyped like crazy is the Foliage Focus. Um, this one, I was actually surprised to see the numbers on this, the NPK on it, and it's 2.19, 0.33, 2.18. But I was looking more into it and it is advertised as a complete fertilizer, meaning it has all 12 macronutrients um, or it has all 12 essential nutrients and they do recommend fertilizing every watering. The next one is the Indo One All Purpose. I can't remember if I've used this before. I think I actually might have, but it would have been for a very small amount of time or maybe it was just the CalMag that I was using. But anyway, the Indo One All Purpose Fertilizer, this one is 1249, definitely a lot stronger than um, the fertilizer I'm using right now. All plants are gonna have different um, needs in, ter in terms of their macro and micronutrients. I am not the person to talk to about that. That's way too scientific for me. But yeah, keep that in mind. This one's a bit stronger. And then the strongest one that I uh, found that is being used a lot right now is the Miracle Grow All Purpose Fertilizer. That one is 24816. 
I probably wouldn't use a fertilizer like this just because I am growing a lot of things in no drainage. I am fertilizing every week and I do think that over time there would be some negative, not consequence, but there would be an effect to using this strong of a fertilizer every week in a no drainage vessel. So like I said, I'm using the TPS one every other week, but I am fertilizing every week on plants that are growing or have current or have pushed out new growth. So on the weeks that I'm not using TPS one, I'm using CalMag. And this is the one that I'm using right now. Um, the NPK of this is 400. Again, using a 2.5 liter jug. I use about two to three milliliters every week opposed to the three to four milliliters of TPS that I'm using. I've said this in another video and the only reason that I go less on the CalMag, even though I've never had any bad effects from CalMag before, the color scares me. It's like this blood red and it's so dark so even with the smallest amount it just drastically changes the color of your um your water and it freaks me out so i tend to go a little lighter on this i'll only go heavier on plants that i feel struggle out of the sheath the um, sodorini was one that i used it a lot on when it was really small the gigas is another one those are the only ones i can think of right now but typically if i'm noticing things are having a difficult time coming out of their caterpillar um, or even forming nice leaves, granted their environmental conditions are good, um, I will just pump up the CalMag a little bit or even do a little bit of a foliar feed. So yeah, going back bef between TPS1 and CalMag every other week with plants that are non-dormant. So any dormant plants, I just water it and I don't give it any fertilizer until I can see new growth. Another thing I'm using right now is TPS Liquid Soil. TPS Liquid Soil, it strips older soil of contaminants and enriches it with microbes, making it healthy and ready for use and reuse year after year. It's made of a powerful salt binding formula that reduces heavy salt loads, it increases microbial pollinations, improves water storage capacity, and nutrient mobility. It contains organic acids designed to buffer and stabilize soil pH. I am using this more heavily on plants that have drainage holes, so I have been using this a lot with my anthurium, and that's because you do want a little bit of water runoff when you're using TPS liquid soil. They actually um, recommend to attempt a 10 to 15% water runoff for best results and use um, warm water. I do use this sometimes on my no drainage vessels that have been in the same vessel for a really long time. So I'll use it and then the next I'll water it a lot, like give it way more water than it needs and then I'll flush it out. I'll dump the water out, I'll water it, I'll dump it out again. And then I'll add a little, a tiny bit more to let it sit in there. Yeah, I just like this because I feel like when I'm doing or when I'm, yeah, when I'm doing sort of my weekly fertilizers, there are some times where I'll be super lazy. I won't measure it in my um, jug. I'll just start pumping in a, in a cup or whatever I'm using and I'll water something. And sometimes I do get a little heavy handed. And so I'll go in with the TPS liquid soil and try and like flush things out if I'm noticing things are going awry or like things are looking a little funky. Um, so it's just a nice security to have and because it has a microbial effect, so it has like beneficial bacteria in there, it kind of fights off some of the yucky things going on in the soil. So if you're having issues with gross soil, may, um, you might give this a try. I haven't had any negative effects that I have noted from using it unless I just didn't notice. But yeah, I really, really like this stuff. The directions say to reuse soil, you use five milliliters per gallon during your cycle flush. Um, and for new soil, apply one time at five milliliter per gallon. In my 2.5 liter jug, honestly, I'm doing about two to three milliliters in that jug probably every three, four months when I can remember. It's not something that I'm doing very, I guess religiously, I'm not doing it like on a weekly basis, but I do like to go in there every few months and do a little flush. 
I probably could do it a bit more with my Ethereum. I just, with all the things that we're doing, re-inoculating things with um, Myco, which I'll talk about later, fertilizing and using things like silica, which I will also talk about, it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. So um, one thing I do want to be better about this year is maybe using this stuff a little bit more. And then in terms of mycorrhizae, so if you guys don't know what mycorrhizal inoculants are, it's basically a like a powder that you can add to your roots or add to water if it's water soluble. And mycorrhizae forms a symbiotic relationship between the fungi and plant roots, forming a network for filaments called mycelium. Um, I'm gonna post, so I've shown you the two that I'm using, Great White and Billions, but I'm gonna show you a photo of mycelium and hopefully I can find a good um, photo of it because some people look at this and they think, oh my gosh, I've got like bad bacteria going on in there, I need to clean it out, but it's actually mycelium and it's a good sign. You'll wanna see that stuff. So I always get really excited when I see mycelium forming in my vessels. And this symbiotic relationship is meant to boost root systems, improve water retention and nutrient uptake. You'll just notice that with the use of myco, things root a lot faster. Um, they root more robustly, like they fill out pots a lot faster. I have definitely noticed that my plants that typically are super, super thirsty and go a longer period between drought if I forget to water it, they don't show as much sign of stress. Like they don't wilt and droop as fast as they normally do. So it's like the water is being held in that plant a lot longer, making them a little bit more resilient. I have heard that myco can help with de not deterring pests, but make them more tolerant to pests, like they don't show as much stress on the leaves opposed to a plant that's not kind of like infused with myco. I don't know, I, I don't really have any like personal testament to that. I feel like whenever I do have spider mites or thrips or whatever it may be, I do see the effects of that. But there are some plants, and I don't know if this is myco or what, but I do see some plants are just completely like no real visible signs of pests until I actually see the pest. But in general, I think if you're going to invest in anything, invest in myco because I just think it automatically kind of makes you a better plant parent because your plants just become a lot stronger and more resilient. And if you want my recommendation on the myco, honestly, I think, I think Great White is probably the top rated myco um, on the market, but I just really like Billions. I just have this affinity for Billions. I don't know why, but Great White, I think, will go a lot further. It'll last you a lot longer. Um, I've been using the same little tub for so long. It's really, like, done what it's advertised to do, and um, I would say the only drawback to um, Great White versus Billions is that it smells kind of funky. It has a very mushroomy smell to it. So if you're not into the mushroom smell, that might put you off a little bit, but it doesn't linger in your plants once you um, once you use it. And also they're both water soluble, which is great. So you don't have to like, you don't have to sprinkle it onto your roots. And I try and re-inoculate my plants. I try and re-inoculate my plants at least once a month if I can remember. Sometimes I'll do it more than that, but yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Anyway, those are sort of the main things I'm using right now. Uh, I am using silica, but I don't, I really don't have much to say about it. This is the one that I'm using. It's the TPS brand one. The NPK on this is 001.3, and I'm using it every about every two to three weeks on my variegated plants. The reason why I haven't been really using this a lot on my other plants, both philodendron and anthurium, is because I had kind of a scary experience with silica before, that one of the first times that I used it, I'm not sure if I went too heavy on it, but I used it on my anthurium, and like one to two days later, so many of them just started yellowing and um, just dying, and it kind of, had I had root rot on, on some of them, whereas it was completely healthy before. I don't know if it was 
coincidence or if it was the silica but i've been kind of scared to use it on my anthurium since then i have heard feedback from people on youtube on other socials on facebook saying that they either have had a similar experience or they've never had an issue with silica at all so i'm still kind of gaining the confidence to use it with other plants because i know it can be beneficial i think i just have to use it correctly but for my variegated plants i'm using it for my elbow i'm using it for my tie i'm using it for my elbow epi um who else am i using it for my fry deck basically anything that has variegation in my collection i'm using it for uh, primarily to help slow down the browning on the white parts of the leaves I definitely have noticed an improvement with my elbow epi um, for sure and my elbow which is living up here um, I'll take a photo of it I was using silica pretty religiously on that thing almost every watering but I was using like the tiniest bit like maybe like 0.5 milliliters or something and even with very little light it wasn't browning and then I just kind of fell off. I moved it to a different location and it just got neglected a little bit in terms of using silica. And you can see in that photo that there is a bit of browning on it. Again, I don't know if this is just it kind of taking its course or if it is because I fell off using silica, but safe to say, I have been back using silica on my elbow since then. But yeah, not much really to report on silica, but I did wanna let you guys know that I'm using it. Quickly talking about moss poles. So right now the primary moss poles that I'm using are the clear hexagon shaped ones. These guys, I get them from my friend Lauren's shop. I will link her in the description. I just really, I really, really love these. I feel like they're just like hassle-free. They're, they're so easy to assemble, easy to extend, and a lot of my plants have done really well on them. Uh, the mix right now that I'm using for my moss poles are tree fern fiber and chopped up moss with a little bit of worm castings. I do find that this mix really helps retain a lot of the water. So I've done just a tree fern fiber pole before. Not only is it very costly to fill a large pole with just tree fern fiber, but it dries out so fast. So I'm finding that with the addition of the moss mixed into it, it's able to hold on to water for a lot longer and then you can stretch your tree fern fiber a lot longer as well. Um, and also I just, the root, the robustness of root growth in these moss poles with the chopped up moss is pretty incredible. Like I said, I do add worm castings just for a little bit of organic material because I'm essentially treating my moss poles as, as an extension of my pole and I water them frequently, I fertilize them. And then another optional thing that you can do with your moss poles if you're not really good at fertilizing or remembering to fertilize your, your moss poles, um, is add slow release fertilizer. It's kind of an easy way to make sure that they get something. You just have to make sure that you're keeping up with your watering or else your moss pole is really not serving its purpose. But that's really the only spiel I have with moss poles. Um, it's the only kind that I'm really using right now. And yeah, everything has been working pretty well for me so far. The next thing I wanna talk about are pests. The two main pests that I deal with constantly are spider mites and thrips. Luckily, the tail end of last year, I really didn't have any issue with thrips at all, but I wanted to just kind of tell you the things that I've done in the past or how I would go about treating thrips now. I was hesitant to talk about this because this is actually not technically legal in Canada, you're not supposed to be bringing it in, but spinosad is an amazing, amazing um, pesticide that you can use for thrips. I find it to be super effective. So right now I just have this spinosad concentrate and it actually smells really good. It's like, it smells really minty. And I just mix about two milliliters per 2.5 liter jug. 
and I water it into my plants and I've also sprayed my plants with it. But if you can't get a concentrate, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew is also um, the main or the active ingredient is spinosad. I have gotten Dead Bug Brew on Amazon. I've gotten it at local plant shops in the States and it a little bit goes a long way. I think you can also buy the concentrate. So give that a try if you are dealing with thrips. Thrips are one of those bugs that you're not really going to get rid of them on one spray, one treatment. I really don't believe anyone who says that they had like a thrips issue. They used spinosad once and then it was completely gone only because of the nature of thrips and how they lay eggs in the soft tissue of your plant, they can stay dormant for a really, really long time and then suddenly they can hatch and you have a whole new round of thrips. So for me, even if, like let's say I have a full on thrips outbreak, I treat one, two, three times um, within a period, I don't see thrips for a long time. My mind is not automatically saying, oh, I got rid of that issue until like six months or a year has gone by i'm like okay now i'm in the clear even now it's been probably more than six months since i've seen a thrip in my house i'm still like constantly checking for them because you never really know what's kind of like hanging out inside of the tissue of your plants um so just make sure that with thrips that you are always vigilant i don't I don't want to like fear monger people into being scared of thrips because honestly after now dealing with spider mites as more of an issue i'm not really even that afraid of thrips anymore like it's a pain in the butt but i don't have that sense of panic and dread like i used to it's one of those pests that they sneak in sometimes and when you get them you just have to deal with it you can isolate if it's possible to isolate your plant and you just have to do regular treatments regular wipe downs make sure that you're just keeping that plant clean and uh, they'll eventually go away spider mites on the other hand i don't know i also don't really believe anyone that says they used like one spray and their spider mites were gone or they showered all their plants once and they were gone i I love cleaning my plants. I actually find it to be therapeutic. I love putting my plants in the shower and just giving them a wash down. But spider mites has been such a nuisance for me. I don't know why it's been so hard to get rid of them, but I basically just like always have spider mites now. It has gotten better since I've been able to kind of concoct a mixture that works for me. So right now I have this bottle that I'll show you here. I fill it mostly with water. I add isopropyl alcohol. Um, you can use anything from the 70% up to the 99%. I know some people have said that they can't find 99% outside of Canada, but they sell 99% here. And then I'll use the Dr. Woods tea tree and peppermint cast style soap. I'll just do a squeeze of each into this bottle and I'll mix it all up. You don't want to go too heavy on the soap because it will leave a residue and it'll leave it really sort of like tacky. You want to make sure that it's just enough that it's in the mixture but not enough to like create buildup. So literally just like a pinch, a drop of each in this bottle and I'm using this as a preventative way to um, keep spider mites away and also as an active treatment. If I'm noticing a plant has a bad case of spider mites, I'll even up the alcohol a bit more. I've even used straight alcohol on my plants before and some of them have been totally fine. It's just the emergent leaves that I would avoid and be a little bit more careful with the velvety guys like gloriosums, your anthurium, things like that. And then the last sort of pesticide that I'm using right now for spider mites, I haven't been using it a lot, especially since I've been pregnant. I've been trying to avoid any like heavy chemicals, but the Dr. Doom spider mite knockout is really, really good. Just keep in mind that it does have a bit of an oily feel to it. Like it is oil based and so if you use too much you'll notice that your plants look oily they'll look shiny or it'll like kind of keep your philodendron looking really dark um which i don't mind but it definitely 
threw me off the first time I ever used it, but I do find it to be very, very effective in that when I used it and I had a heavy coat of it on a plant, whenever a spider mite infestation would, you know, reemerge, I would notice spider mites on these plants that I've treated, but they're like all dead. So, I mean, that's a good sign that they came they came in contact with the spider mite knockout and it knocked them out. <laughs> so um, don't be surprised if you treat with spider mite knockout and you still notice some spider mites on it, there's a good chance that they're dead. Um, and then you can just wash it away. And on that note, some people have asked when I use my spray, my spider mite mixture or spider mite knockout, like do I use it and then like wash it off? No, I always leave it on the leaves. All right, lighting is our next little topic. So I'm using three kinds of lights right now. The majority of my house is being powered by Barinas. So all of the lights, well, most of the lights that you see behind me are Barinas. These are Barinas, Barinas. I have a mix of Barinas and my other lights here, but for the most part, I would say 98% of this room is powered by Barinas. So Barinas are 10 watts. The thing I like about them is that I find, I find them to be affordable for what you get. And I like that they come in larger packs so that if you are on a budget, you can share with a friend and split them. I like that they're buildable. So if you have one shelf and like the 10 watts isn't enough for you, you can always add a second bar. And I do think that they have a nice color temperature. So that's a plus. I really, really love the color temp of the Barina. I think it's like that perfect soft warm white. The only drawback I would say to the Barina are that the connecting cords are so comically short. I know you can get longer ones if you order it, but I just feel like they should come with longer cords to connect them because going from shelf to shelf, it's like impossible. They do have, I think they come with like two long cords, but the rest are like these dinky little things that it's just, yeah. I've found a lot of them to be useless. Um, so I would say that's the one drawback of Barina. Some people have said Barinas are just not strong enough for them and they're just kind of gimmicky, but I have found my plants to grow fine under them. And um, I've even had plants burn under them as well. So that has not been my experience. I would recommend the Barina to anybody who asks. Before I was using Barina though, I was using Monios lights. These ones are a bit stronger than the Barina. These are 24 watts. I would say the pros to them are that they are strong, obviously more than double the wattage of the Barina. The color temp is nice. You can't, probably can't tell, but these are Barina right here. These are Monios, and you can see how much brighter it is down here. But the color is, it's not, I mean, it's not exactly the same. The Monios is a little bit cooler in temperature, whereas the Barinas um, have a bit yellower, warmer uh, tones to them. But it's still nice. I still think if this whole room was powered by Monios, I would still love it as much as the Barinas. Just be careful, I have had plants get super, super bleached and chlorotic under Monios lights. But if you're looking for something stronger, I would recommend these. And then the last lights that I've been using, which is kind of a newer addition, are the Soltec Vita lights. These ones that I bought were 20 watts. Uh, I would say a huge pro to them are that they have they have the perfect color temperature and that it's a bulb and you can use it in something like a clamp light or like a standing floor light or something. You can use it in a, uh, whatchamacall, track light if you can find one big enough. The only thing that I wish about the Vitas are that they came in a stronger wattage because these are 20 watts and I'm using two of them in my plant room right now to light the very top of my plant room. But from the distance that they're at right now, it's only really giving these, these plants somewhere between 
um, like 100 and 250 foot candles. So unless they're like really, really close or like right on top of it as a pendant, you're not going to get super, super strong of light. So I do wish that these came in 40 watts, but I will say that I have been loving them so far and I do think that they are, they nailed it with the color temperature on these. Um, so those are the three that I'm using. I got all of them basically on Amazon. I actually, no wait, I purchased my Vita lights through Soltec directly, but they do sell them on Amazon as well. And then the last thing are just kind of the miscellaneous stuff. I wanted to talk about the things that I'm using to house my plants because I get um, this question often. Actually, before I forget, my vessels, my clear vessels. This is probably my most frequently asked question. All of my clear glass vessels are either gonna be from thrift stores or from the dollar store. I rarely, if ever, get a glass vessel at like a retail store like Home Goods, Home Sense, Target, whatever, because they're just crazy overpriced. Although the prices of them at thrift stores are getting more expensive and same with the dollar store, but I still find it to be the best value and you can find a different array of sizes when you go somewhere like a thrift store. So if you're looking for glass vessels, I would try your local um, thrift store first before you buy anything online. Okay, and then going into the things that I house my stuff. So I'm gonna talk about my tent first. So this is the tent I'm using. It is from Mars Hydro. Um, this one was gifted to me when I was still a uh, when I was still sponsored by them. So I opted for the smallest size. I kind of wish I got something bigger, but at the time I didn't really have space for it. Nor do I really have space for a larger tent now. But it would have been nice if I could have something a little taller. But anyway, the size that I have is two feet by two feet by four point five feet. I think it's a good size for like your basic needs. Um, but if you're planning to grow something long term in here, I it just it's way it's way too small unless you're maybe growing like two to three plants at most. This is not going to be the size that you want. Um, you want to get something bigger because right now I'm using it for my rehab, my rehab plants, my seedlings, propagation, seeds, and Ethereum that are acclimatizing um, to come out of the tent. But I think overall, it's a really good tent. I recommend it. I haven't had any issues with it at all. It's very sturdy, haven't had any rips or tears so far. So uh, yeah, if you're looking or if you're in the market for a tent um, and Mars Hydro is on your list, you have my recommendation. And then my exos. Exos are another thing I get a lot of questions about. So this guy right here, am I pointing at him? Yeah, this guy right here. This is my favorite, favorite, favorite exo size. So this one is 24 inches wide, 18 inches deep, and 36 inches tall. I just think it's such a great size for someone who maybe only has the budget or the space for one XO. I highly recommend this size because you have the flexibility of growing a ton of small plants or a mix of like small to large plants. Like you can see my big scalp room is in there, my patty which is getting really big, and then I have a little variety of smaller plants in there. And it just looks really pretty. Like I just think that this is like the best exo size that they've made. By the way, if you don't know what an exo is, it's actually a reptile enclosure. So I've gotten all of mine from reptile stores or secondhand on Marketplace or from people in the Facebook group. Um, things like that. This one next to me, obviously it has no doors because one of them broke and I just decided to make it an open XO. So this one is 36 inches wide, 18 inches deep, and 36 inches tall. This one is definitely a luxury to have if you can afford it, if you can have the space for it. I bought this one secondhand from a friend and she sold it to me for a fraction of the price. I'm not sure. I mean, it's a great exo size if you have the space, but it's really expensive. I think brand new, this thing is like $500 or something like that. And I just would not pay that much for an exo. I'd much rather just get a tent or get another one of these guys. And then I have one more exo down here, this guy right here. 
So that one is 18 inches wide, 18 inches deep, and 24 inches tall. I would say that this is the smallest I would go. I used to have ones smaller than this and ones that were like really small and wide and I just don't recommend them. Long term, it doesn't really make sense. Things outgrow them so fast and it to me, it's just, it was a waste of money. It was a waste of space. I'd much rather invest in something at least this size that they can grow into or something like that where again, they can grow into it. Okay, so those are all of the enclosures that I'm using in terms of greenhouses. These shelves, these wire shelves are all from Amazon. They come in all different sizes. Um, I like these because you can adjust the heights to exactly what you need. They are definitely more affordable than your like the nicer shelves. And I don't know, I just kind of like the look of a more industrial look in my plant room. I wouldn't use something like this in like my living room or anything. But for the plant room, it works just fine. They're very, very sturdy, very solid. You can see I have this massive XO on here and she's not going anywhere. So I recommend these. I will link some of the ones that I have in the description. I'm also using a smaller one in my tent. And then the last thing um, I get this question all the time too is where did you get your living room shelf? So I don't like advertising this because it's so overpriced, but I got my living room shelf um, back in 2017 when it was only like $250 or something and to me that was still kind of on the expensive side but I really really liked this shelf so I splurged on it um, since then the price has gone up so much but if you're interested it's called the Sigmund Itagori bookcase from Wayfair and it is over $500 right now and I did just buy a second one I did not enjoy spending that much money on it. It's probably not even worth that much. I can tell you it's not worth that much, but I just, I really wanted to have a second one to make a full wall. And so it was just the cost that I decided to eat. But if you're wondering, the bookcase is 47 and a half inches wide. It's 68 inches tall, 13 inches deep, and there is 12 and a half inches between each shelf. I wish that the shelf had a bit more space in between them. I think even 14 inches would have been like perfect. 14, 15 inches would have been like amazing, but I'm making do with the very short um, gap or this short space in between each shelf. But I, I look at that shelf and I just feel so happy and I feel, all the serotonin and I just, I love it in my house. So to me it was worth it, but I know spending $500 on a shelf is crazy insane, especially for one that's made of like particle board wood. It's not even like real wood. The wood that's on it, it's just like a laminate sheet, like a wallpaper type thing. So if you peel it, you're just gonna see like that compressed board. So I try to not think about it too much because geez Louise, that was a lot of money, but um, yeah. To me, it was worth it just to have that complete wall. So anyway, that is gonna wrap it up for this reference video. I hope I answered some of your questions so that you didn't have to dig through three years of videos. Hopefully you found this helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for being here. If you are new to this channel, hello. Um, I'm Charmaine, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for subscribing and being here. Um, if you liked this video, please don't forget, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And I will see you in the next one.